I'm on Battlefield 5 again, and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. This monitor has 165Hz refresh rate, and I've got the game running at a good solid 165 frames a second at the moment, so I'm making the most out of the monitor in terms of its responsiveness. This high refresh rate does a few things for you. I'm sure many of you will be aware of this by now, but for those who aren't, or who those who want a bit of a refresher, it greatly improves the connected feel, which describes the precision and the fluidity when you're interacting with the game world. And that is something which is also aided by low input lag. And this monitor does have low input lag. I measured around three milliseconds. That indicates a really nice low signal delay on this monitor. So that's not a particular thing that you have to concern yourself with. The other advantage of this high refresh rate, high frame rate combination is that it reduces the perceived blur due to eye movement. So there are two main forms of perceived blur when you observe motion on a monitor. One is linked to the movement of your eyes, and that is something which the high refresh rate and high frame rate will help with. The other is related to the pixel responses, also very important. And there's a nice method of capturing both elements of perceived blur called pursuit photography. And that is explored a little bit in the responsiveness section of the written review and in more detail in a responsiveness article linked to there. So if you're interested in the technical side of things, definitely check that out. But I'm going to show you some pursuit photographs on the screen with this monitor running at 165 hertz. In the written review, there are various other examples at low refresh rates as well, if you're interested in that. But what you can see here are some distinct weaknesses. So there are different overdrive settings or smart response, as they call them on this monitor, off, fast, faster, and fastest. First of all, we can rule out fastest as a useful setting. Even for the transition shown here, there's obvious overshoot. You can see an obvious colorful trail behind the UFO and an inky look for the dark background behind the UFO. Again, overshoot there, different manifestation of that, but it's not attractive. In practice, you can also see some overshoot artifacts of the sort of an interlaced appearance to the overshoot. And some transitions show really extreme levels of overshoot with this setting. So it's not a useful setting. Faster, on the other hand, that's the best you'll do without any real issues with overshoot. But even then, there are some issues with slower than optimal pixel transitions. So if you compare this to the reference screen, the AOC CQ32 G3SU, that is a VA reference, that is what I consider quite an average or slightly above average, really, VA performer. And that does actually outperform this Philips. And the M27Q, that is a reasonable IPS model. It's not the fastest IPS model out there, but it's at a reasonable level. And that comfortably outperforms this Philips at 165 hertz. The Philips here performs very similar to that ViewSonic alternative that I've mentioned a few times in the review so far. I'd say that the Philips is better tuned at lower refresh rates, and I will get onto that a little bit later. But for these high refresh rates, very similar weaknesses here. You can see smeary trailing behind, particularly for the dark background, that's the top row. Also a fair bit for the medium background, that's the middle row. Performance is a bit better for the light background, but still not perfect, that's the bottom row. So for this scene here, the performance isn't too bad, and that's because there are lots of medium and brighter shades where the pixel transitions are quite reasonable, actually, more reasonable than you saw with the test UFO just then. But there are some darker shades mixed in, so the dark shade there at the edge of the wall with the medium sky in the background. Yeah, there's some smeary trailing. You can also see this kind of thing if there are brightly saturated objects. I haven't really got any particularly good examples here, but brightly painted objects, for example, sort of a bit for this cloth here with medium backgrounds. You can also see this smeary trailing, more distinct weaknesses. Jumping into another scene, this one is dominated more by darker shades, so there are some transitions with which this monitor does struggle with. And, you know, I can see the smeary trailing around the flag there around the canoes down here. And I'm just circling the mouse a bit to try and, and also the rock there, just circling the mouse a bit to show this more clearly, but linear motions will show it as well. It just shows it a bit more clearly on the video. Definite weaknesses. Doesn't really need too much more of an explanation. Makeshift roof as well, smeary trailing. 
There's nothing really in the way of overshoot that jumps out. It's just a little bit of overshoot in places, but it's just not obvious. If you want to, of course, speed things up and use the fastest setting, then I hope you like overshoot. Looks absolutely beautiful, but really not what you want to see when you're gaming. Certainly not what I want to see when I'm gaming. So whether this is going to be too much for you, I'm back to my preferred faster setting, by the way, whether these weaknesses are going to be annoying to you, that's a very subjective and personal thing. It really just depends on your own sensitivities. And I also like to point out that it doesn't always manifest as smeary trailing. So whether mixtures of lighter and darker shade, medium dark and medium somewhat brighter shades, if that makes sense, to the bush here, what happens is the brighter shades darken during movement and they brighten up correctly when the movement ceases. So that can give you a flickering effect during movement, which some people can find a bit annoying as well. And you can also see this kind of thing on the desktop. It's not just on games where you can notice these weaknesses and also a bit on movies, although they'll be at a lower frame rate, so the weaknesses aren't as pronounced there. And I do explore this a bit more in the written review, but there are some weaknesses even for movie content, but they just aren't as pronounced. But on the desktop, it depends on the scrolling behavior, but I've got Twitter on dark mode here, or lights out as they call it. And if you look at the light gray there, it blends into black during movement and then lightens up when the movement ceases. And that's again, the flickering effect. It depends on the scrolling behavior though, or the browser you're using. I'm using Firefox here, but I've just hopped onto Google Chrome. This has different scrolling behavior. On Twitter, at least, it uh, scrolls more of the screen at the same time, so you don't get that kind of flickering effect, and you don't really notice smeary trailing with how the scrolling behavior works here. And also, if you're looking at websites with dark text against a light background, these sort of weaknesses aren't really apparent there either. But it does depend on what you're viewing, and when you're moving windows around and in certain applications with high frame rate animations, then, yeah, these weaknesses can be apparent. I'm just going on to Gigabyte's website because for some reason that uh, even on Google Chrome shows some quite clear weaknesses. Even when you're just scrolling. So yes, there's certainly a lot of the smeary trailing going on here. This monitor does support VRR, variable refresh rate, and it can be used with adaptive sync and also HDMI 2.1 VRR, which is integrated into HDMI 2.1. That means you can use it with the PS5, which doesn't support adaptive sync. And you can use AMD FreeSync and you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. So you can have lots of options with VRR on this one, but the performance isn't perfect. It has an advertised 48 to 165 hertz VRR range. I found that that was more like 55 to 165 hertz most of the time, but below the floor of operation, so 55 hertz or what would be a claimed 48 hertz, LFC, low frame rate compensation, kicks in, and that keeps tearing stuttering at bay as well by keeping the refresh rate at a multiple of the frame rate. The technology does work in terms of the removal of tearing and stuttering, and if you're sensitive to that kind of thing, it's really nice to have this. But be aware that when LFC does activate, there's a momentary stuttering when it activates or deactivates in either direction, basically. And that's not great if you're frequently passing the boundary and you're sensitive to that, but if you're not, or you're only occasionally passing the boundary, it's not something I'd worry about too much. Something which may be more of an issue is VRR flickering. So when that boundary is crossed, the refresh rate suddenly doubles or suddenly jumps up to nearly double, that's a big change. And equally, when the frame rate of your game is fluctuating heavily, even without LFC being crossed, then VRR flickering can become rather extreme, rather obvious on this model. So I'm just running a VRR flickering test, and this will specifically cause significant fluctuations in the refresh rate. It's going all over the place and I can see obvious flickering throughout this gradient. So for the darker shades, the medium shades, and the brighter end, basically for all of these shades, obvious flickering. Now, this is something which is common on VA models to some degree, and also OLEDs actually, but OLEDs, it's focused more on the darker shades, and that's because the contrast is so strong, and there are some slight gamma changes, which are just apparent because the contrast is so strong. 
On models where the contrast is significantly weaker, so particularly your IPS models, TN models, then VRR flickering doesn't really manifest itself even for the darker shades because the contrast just isn't strong enough to sort of show these particular gamma shifts. But with VA models, there are also some voltage sensitivities to be aware of, and that's what causes these issues for brighter shades as well. So the flickering is more widespread. If I open up the OSD, you'll see that the refresh rate is really going all over the place, massive fluctuations. You're unlikely to see such extreme fluctuations in games. It can happen in some scenes though. Back to the game now, I've got it running at 100 frames a second and I can see some flickering even though the refresh rate is quite stable. But I did notice that when the fluctuations aren't too high and the frame rate is at least in the triple digits or high double digits, I didn't have the same level of VRR flickering that I noticed on the ViewSonic alternative, because with the ViewSonic, it was actually so intense and so extreme, so widespread that I had to disable VRR. I couldn't bear to use it. Whereas on the Philips, I would actually use VRR, at least with my RTX 3090, which I'm using at the moment. And if I'm able to at least have decent, sort of fairly stable frame rates, but yes, those greater fluctuations, which can happen from time to time, can cause more noticeable issues. And again, even when it's quite stable, there are some issues. So if you're sensitive to flickering, then this could be annoying. But aside from that, VRR does work well. So at 100 hertz, as I'm running at the moment, the weaknesses are a bit less pronounced than they were at 165 hertz in terms of the smeary trailing, because the pixel response requirements are reduced now, but it's still there certainly there. I don't really see anything untoward in the way of overshoot, nothing that really jumps out there. 80 frames a second now, more of the same. Again, a bit of a reduction in the smeary trailing, a little bit of overshoot creeping in, but nothing that's particularly pronounced even here, so that's good to see. And 60 frames a second, even now, there are some weaknesses in terms of smeary trailing which do persist, but certainly less pronounced than they were at higher frame rates. The pegs on the roof here, with the medium to darker shades in the background, yeah, that does show some quite distinct weaknesses even at 60 hertz. A bit of that going on with the boats down there again, and the rock, and this flag. So yeah, even here, there are some weaknesses and picks of responsiveness. But nothing that jumps out too much in the way of overshoot. There is some halo trailing now around the tree, which I notice. So it's brighter than the background and stands out a bit for that reason, but I wouldn't say this is extreme overshoot. If you want to completely remove the overshoot, then you're going to have to actually turn the overdrive off. So if you set it to fast, then it actually increases the smeary trailing. But the overshoot really persists in a fairly similar way. Perhaps it's reduced a bit for this transition, but just observing more broadly, that there are definitely some instances where overshoot's really just as obvious with faster and fast in my view. So I've now set it to off, which completely eliminates the overshoots, but also the, the smeary trailing is now extreme. It's just horrible, a huge amount of additional perceived blur. So back to 165 hertz and my preferred faster setting now. Just to summarize really, the monitor doesn't offer a particularly compelling pixel response experience. I would say that it was nice to see a bit less VRR flickering than I saw on the view Sonic and less than I've seen on some VA models more broadly, but it is still a potential issue. Input lag is nice and low. I just have to stress how subjective it is. For some people, the responsiveness will be okay here, but this is marketed as a gaming monitor, and for me, even when I was playing games casually, I just found the responsiveness too weak. I'm quite sensitive to it, though, so, you know, take that for what it's worth. But I do feel that even for casual games, this can be... A bit of a pain at times. Also the monitor doesn't have a strobe backlight setting, it doesn't have a black frame insertion mode if you prefer to call it that. The ViewSonic did have one but it wasn't a particularly good one so I don't see this as a huge loss and really this panel just isn't fast enough to make a good go of that kind of setting.